Shalom, this is Avram Shira from Eretz Israel. Welcome to our Erev Shabbat talk from Parshat Truma in the holy book, the Zohar Kadosh of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. The Rebbe is going to open up with a discussion about God's love for the Jews and his wanting to connect to him and his wanting to reveal his will to them. And if you read it on the surface, it looks kind of like a little bit of favoritism going on between God and the Jewish people. Now, favoritism, we know, is what got uh, Yaakov Avinu in trouble with Yosef and his brothers. We know there was other favoritism that Yitzhak uh, Avinu was a- accused of showing, certainly his mother, towards Esav and Yaakov. So we understand, as, as just as normal people, we understand that favoritism is going to really hurt children. And that as parents, our job is to try to be equally loving to all our children, and it's a test because some kids are <laughs> more lovable than others. What can you say? And yet we see here that the the relationship of God and why I call this little talk, how much is God like man? Because when we learn about ourselves, we can learn about God's traits. And, and a lot of people chafe at that. They don't like the idea that we compare God to man or man to God. He's eternal. He's infinite. He's perfect. And we're not any of those things. But in truth... If we look deep enough, we'll see that we are. And we'll see that we have to be. When you understand the mechanics of creation, and you understand that we are made from a portion of Him, then you understand that we have to carry a trace of all those qualities and all those powers that we ascribe in the Kabbalah to the human soul, that they reflect back on God, and God's parts reflect back on us. And there's this symbiotic reflection going on between us and the Creator. And when we understand that, we it's a little bit more homey around here, you know? It's a little bit more, like, comfortable to think that, oh, yeah, God is like us. He, he gets angry. He's jealous. He's patient sometimes. He has to wage war sometimes. He makes peace sometimes. And if you look throughout the epithets and the, the different nicknames that are given to God, it looks very much like we're projecting onto Him our human qualities, when in truth, when we look at it, and what we l- look at the Sfarim, we look at the books, and of course the five books of Moses beginning is the beginning of our, our book journey, we see that really he's projecting onto us. So it's not simply that we're looking for handles to get a hold of this infinite being. Rather, he's giving us the handles. He's making us with those handles. So when we, when we want to know how to behave or how to act as a father or a husband, we can look in the Torah and we can find examples that's go, that are going to teach us. And so we, we begin the parsha of the Zohar. It says, Adonai Moshe lemor. Of course, God spoke to Moses. Right? He tells Moses, tell the Jews to take for me Truma. Truma is the first portion of your crops, the first portion of your produce from the trees and the fields that we give to the Kohanim, the tribe of priests, because, well, priests have to be priests. You know, they got to stay in the temple and work, and they're not going to have the opportunity to create a, <clears throat> a lifestyle or an income, if you will, from simply being a farmer, because they have responsibilities to teach and to learn and to s- serve the Jewish people. So our responsibility to them is to feed them. So automatically we're creating up another symbiotic relationship between different levels of the nation. Does that mean they're better because they're priests? Well, it depends on if you're hungry, right? <laughs> and, and so there is this idea of better is really, it, it's, it's a shell in Kabbalah. It's called a klipa. It's a shell of, in our mind, which I guess in, in modern parlance, that would be, a, a stigma or a projection of my own insecurity. Okay, so that I need to lift somebody up too high or bring somebody down too low. No, we're here to see each other with love, eye to eye, appreciating every human being. Okay, but God tells the Jews, take truma. And the Mishnah tells us elsewhere in the oral law that the secret of Eretz Israel, the reason why this land is holy is because we take from the produce of the land and we create charity with it. 
So you see, it's the idea of just simple idea of taking what you have and giving something to somebody else sanctifies the very land that grows the food. And he, and then he, and what we're seeing here is the next piece of the verse is that ish asher yidvenu libo. Every person takes and gives according to what their heart tells them. It is not a fixed, locked command. It is something that God wants to come from us. And this is also very important. When you're that powerful, you know, when you're the, the, the president of the corporation, if you're the president of the country, when you have all power in any situation over your children or over your employees or over your worker, whatever it might be, you know, is it if you're healthy, you don't get particularly a lot of pleasure from telling other people what to do. Now, there are plenty of unhealthy people that love telling people what to do, <laughs> but that's not coming from a good place. But if you're healthy, you don't really take your pleasure from that. It's necessary. That's what being a leader means. If you want your company to succeed, you have to tell your employees what to do. But it's not coming from the place of needing the power. So God doesn't want to do that either with us. He says, no, don't, don't give me something because I told you. Give something because you want to give. Because you recognize the beauty of taking from your produce, whatever it might be, and giving it to, in this case, the Kohanim. And the Kohanim, of, of course, give to the Levi'im because they're also servants in the temple and they have different jobs. Okay, so with that backdrop, the Zohar now begins with a statement by Rabbi Chia. We just jumped 2,000 years, well, 1,500 years from the Torah to the Zohar period. Rabbi Chia opened up his discourse, and he says, Yaakov bachar lo ya Yisrael segulato. Right, it's a famous verse from King David in the Psalms. D Jacob, the Jewish people as a collective, chose God. Yisrael is gulato. Now it's a very interesting thing. It says Yaakov chose Yaakov bachar lo ya. He chose God. And then it says Yisrael is gulato, and Israel became his. Treasured nation. Now, a segula is a very interesting word in Hebrew because it can mean a charm, it can mean a blessing, it can mean a chosen or choice portion. It can also mean that which is designed to cause change in others, but nonetheless, or change someone's destiny, if you will. So we chose God and that changed our destiny and so he chose us. So if we had not said, I don't want the, if we had said, I don't want the Torah, I'm sorry, it's not for us, it's too hard, it's too difficult, it's too out there, I can't believe, I can't understand all this, I don't want it. If we had said that, God would have moved on. He would have found somebody else to give the Torah to. And we, as we learned in our, our class two days ago on face, on uh, Patreon, the reason that God didn't give the Torah to everybody at once was because he saw that the Jews would, were, were stubborn and they would give it over to their children and they would tell the story of what happened to them in Egypt. So the whole key of understanding the Jews is understanding that they came out of Egypt with a mission. What was the mission? To tell the story about coming out of Egypt. And that's what Passover is. And that's what our tefillin, those little black boxes we wear, have all the, in, the, the parchments contain the verses of leaving Egypt. So coming out of Egypt is the essential identifying feature of this people. And why, why, why did he create that story that we had to go into Pharaoh's nation and become enslaved and then come out with these great wonders and plagues in order that we would tell it? And why does he need us to tell it? Because he, the, Zohar, the Zohar teaches, <laughs> and Rabbi uh, Or Haim Kadosh, Rabbi Haim Ben Atar says, because if we don't, and also Rabbi, uh, Moshe Ben Nachman, there's, there's a bunch of commentators on the same pasukim in the Torah that speak about this, because if he had given the Torah to everybody, they wouldn't have remembered it. They wouldn't have forced their children to learn it, and their grandchildren, and the next generation, and so on. That there, these great miracles would have happened, and people would have become free, and and after a few generations they would have forgotten. 
And that wasn't God's purpose. Because his purpose was this, this narrative would be carried on for thousands of years. And he said, if I give it to everybody, they're not going to remember it. They're not going to share it properly. But if I give it to one people, and that's their job, that's their identity, then they're going to hold on to it. Because, you know, people are very identity bound. I'm an American. It's important to me that I'm an American. And if I'm Spanish or French or Italian, whatever it is, they all have some kind of identity based on their history. And a human being without identity is a lost creature. If I don't know where I come from, how can I figure out where I'm supposed to go? If I don't know what I'm here to do, how can I achieve the sense of self-fulfillment that makes it worthwhile being on this planet? If I don't feel fulfilled with what I'm doing, then I, you know, I'm looking for the next pub, you know, <laughs> I want a cold beer because I don't know what to do. So that's, that's a big problem when people are, are rootless, when they don't have identity, when they don't have purpose and direction, all kinds of not pleasant things happen. Okay, so the Jewish people were given this mission, this identity of telling the story of how they got out of Egypt, and that becomes the reason God chose them, is that they would do that, and the reason he wants to be attached to us. It's not that he doesn't want to be attached to all the other nations. It's that rather the Zohar is teaching us that they want, that God wanted to attach to us because we were fulfilling the mission. Now, is that favoritism? Well, on one hand, you could say, well, it still looks like favoritism. But on the other hand, the Jews are doing something special to carry God's reputation around this planet and teaching this book and, and trying to live the book, which is really the first part, the most important part. If we live it, then our lives become teachings. If we don't live it, then we're just like, well, blowing a little hot air. But still... When, we're, when we take that on, it makes you a more beloved person. If you go to your boss and say, you know what, I've got an idea to really make this company big. And when he sees your idea, he might say it's a great idea or he might say it's not. But he sees that you care. He sees that you're interested. And that you're not there just for your nine to five and your check. I don't even know if they give checks anymore, right? It's all electronic. But you know what I mean. And so you see that there is this idea of God choosing a people to do his will in order that the rest of the people get the story. And if we hadn't carried the story down for thousands of years, then no one else would have the story. And then all the other monotheistic religions would lose the central column, the spine of identity of what it means to be created by God. So even if I'm a non-Jew, I can still say, well, I'm still God's child. I'm still created in the image of the Creator. It says that the first man was created in that image. So it's not a put-down to be a non-Jew, and it's not a put-up to be a Jew. It's a job, just like everybody has a job. You know, what's more important? Well, it depends, you know, what your what your goal is. And God set out the goal for us to reveal his presence in order to show that we are created in his honor for his glory. And we have a spark of divinity in us that really, <laughs> I'm planning on cashing in that chip because it tells you that we don't die, right? And when I heard that, I said, oh, now I understand why when I was running around Orlando, Florida, as a 20-year-old doing what you do in college, I used to think, ah, I feel like I'm never going to die. Like I loved life even then, and I was, that was long before religion. But I felt that sense of eternality in things. And only after many years of searching and driving around the country and around the world did I finally discover that, yes, it is actually true. There is a part of this that doesn't die. And you want to cash in that chip, you know, you want to take that to the bank. And otherwise, well, I've kind of missed the boat, right? So the Zohar is going to go on to tell us, right? Who is like the Jews, one nation in the land? Well, that sounds like, again, a, a, a self-serving, it's from Shmuel, the prophet Shmuel, uh, who, and, well, 
isn't that kind of self-serving? We're praising ourselves? No, because it's it's an inspiration of a Jew from God that makes him say that about the people. Because these people, they really want Hashem, and they attach themselves to Him by doing the mitzvah. Yaakov said, I want God first. And Esav, his twin brother, you can have all the oil, you can have all the land, I just need a little piece at the end of the Mediterranean to do my thing. You can have all the other continents, and you can rule the world and have all the gold and silver. But I chose Bechar Lo Yah. He chose God as his inheritance. Now, of course, he's a smart guy. He knows that if I choose the one who creates everything, then I'm going to get a portion also in all the other great things that he chooses. Ki helak Hashem Amo, because the portion of God is his nation. Now, there's a, a lot of other ways that we can interpret this verse. Uh, one is, of course, that since if all the Jews have this special spark, then what happens when they get together? Well, this big critical mass of spiritual energy is created. And that we call the divine presence. And that's when nature becomes transformed. And that's one of the reasons why, well, a lot of people out there don't want the Jews all living together in the land. Because when we get together in the land, we become a, a force to be dealt with, a spiritual force, not necessarily a military force, a force for good. But it's one that obliterates atheism. It obliterates secular secularity, and it takes all these concepts of do what I want, and I can do what I want, and I have my own thing, and I don't care about God. It, that's out the door when you see the way the creation really works. And not people are interested in that. And also, the next point is even more outrageous. God gave the power of the nations over us. Why did he do that? If we're so special, why did God put the Jews under the Egyptian rule and under the Greek rule? The Greek, oh, that's a new one. The, the Greek, the Greece rule and the Romans and the English and the, everywhere we've gone, we've been ruled over. The Russians. The germ everywhere. Why did he put us in those places? Why didn't he put us on top? One time we were on top when King Solomon and King David were around. And from then on, it's been downhill. Why did he put us that way? Because by putting the Jewish people as the underdogs, it created a position of growth, a place of expansion a place of needing to exercise our power in the utmost way. And that is how you prove that there is a God. By being the underdog and you still win. And you still fulfill the prophecies. And you still live the life that was promised to us thousands of years ago. It's a sign to the rest of the nations, wow, there's something here. These Jews just keep coming back. And we're back for good, as you can see. And there's still plenty of people that don't want us here. That's okay. That's their job. They chose a very poor job, obviously. But the point really is, is that by being the underdogs, we become the emblem of God's victory. Now, the victory, of course, is just the victory of goodness. It's not the victory of weapons, you know, <laughs> and viruses and eugenics, and all these other non-godly concepts. It's the victory of good over evil, just like all every movie tells you. So we can understand a little bit more why we've gone in this exile, why we've been ruled over by all these people. And the Zohar is telling us, in a very simple way, and God chose our, his portion with us, the Zohar is telling us, when you do truma, listen closely, when you take the best portion of your crop, of your field, and give it to the priest, it makes that portion special, and nobody but the priest is allowed to eat it anymore. Even though it was your cucumber, you gave it to the priest, now it's a holy cucumber, and he gets to make his own pickles, right? <laughs> the Jewish people are God's truma. The, the Jewish people were chosen and put aside for this job, and therefore, they, came, they became, by this choice, that truma. 
that ma'aser, that special offering that's taken out of the field and given for a special purpose, just like the priests get a portion from everybody else. So too, the Jews become the portion for everybody else, but we have to remain separate. We have to remain tight to the law. We have to be loyal to ourselves and our dignity and our true mission. And so you see that even a little thing like taking off the 10% of your wheat crop or your oranges is still a deep, deep teaching in the hands of the Zohar about the structure of the nations and the Jewish people and the redemption of the world through this symbiotic system, this relationship that we have between creator and creation, between Jew and non-Jew, between the messianic vision and all those who are going to receive from it. So we're getting we're getting closer, folks, day by day, hour by hour. Shabbat is almost here. Got to say goodbye for now. We'll see you this week again on Patreon, YouTube, Facebook, Lighthouse, Web Yeshiva, Inside Timer. New new meditations are coming out. New teachings. You know, whatever God sends, we're gonna we're gonna throw it up on these vessels because why did He give us internet so we could <laughs> so we could go on Alibaba, you know, and shop for, for another pair of shoes. I think it's it's much greater. The, 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 the tools that we've been given in this generation are the, are the tools that are going to bring the messianic spirit in a tidal wave of holiness. And we're all going to benefit from that. God bless you all. Shabbat Shalom.